Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> Kelvin, stop it. <laughs> Te veo. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to this um, Yale Science Academy Conversations with Scientists. Today, we are going to be discussing careers in industry. And we have three fabulous panelists who I am going to briefly introduce. Um, first, we have Do Dr. Carlos Bosques, who currently serves as Director of Biologics Discovery at Momenta Pharmaceuticals in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In this role, Dr. Bosques is responsible for leading the discovery and early development of new therapeutics for the treatment of autoimmune diseases. He obtained his doctoral degree in biological chemistry from the chemistry department at MIT and completed his bachelor's degree in chemistry at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. We also have Dr. Ignacio Nacho Pino. Um, he uh, became a veterinarian and practiced for 10 years before deciding to become a biotechnology entrepreneur. Um, and now he has uh, a company in Puerto Rico. He has developed a, a world-class biotechnology company focused on human protein research and discovery, and it's called CDI Laboratories. Um, and this company has really become a, a flagship of the Puerto Rico biotech industry and serves as a blueprint to accelerate new, new ventures in, in this area. And last but not least, we have Dr. Deborah Soto Ortega. She is a senior scientist at Amgen in Juncos, Puerto Rico. Um, she currently manages the Purification Sciences um, Process Development Group that supports multiple drug substance processes, including uh, medicines like Epigen, RNFs, and um, other pipeline molecules. She received a bachelor's degree in industrial biotechnology from the University of Puerto Rico at Mayagüez and her PhD in biomedical engineering at the University of South Carolina. So thank you, Carlos, Nacho, and Deborah for being with us today to talk about um, your path to, to career in industry and to answer the many questions that I'm sure our fellows will have. So to kind of kickstart our, our conversation, I want to ask each of you, uh, what made you decide to pursue a career in industry versus um, other careers after, after finishing your, your doctorate degrees? And I'll start with, with Carlos. You're muted. <laughs> uh, to the organizers for uh, no. Thank you. Let me see some. Nope. Is that? Can everyone hear me now? Yep. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. So. So thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for setting up this very nice uh, uh, session with with everyone, and to talk about career development, which is. Um, I, retrospectively, uh, I wish I had some of these opportunities in the past when I was when I was uh, uh, in school. So happy to participate and, and hope we can help you guys in any way we can. Um, so addressing the question, what uh, led me to to go into an academic career? Uh, funny story, I I actually never thought I would be in an, in a uh, an industrial career. I should say. I, I was focused in an academic career during my PhD and postdoc. Um, uh, was always very interested in developing new therapies and, and new technologies. Um, and as I was uh, developing, getting ready with my proposals, my grants, uh, and was going through interviews in industry, um, I had an opportunity to go and help this little company that was starting up uh, called Momenta uh, in, the, in the way that they were actually interested in doing some of the things that were actually written in my grants and my proposals. So I thought it was a good fit. I originally went to the company for what I was convinced was gonna be one year uh, to help them as what I thought it was gonna be as a consultant. And I, was, I promised I was actually gonna come back to academia after a year uh, but um, 
to my surprise, I really, really, uh, it was an eye-opening experience. I really enjoyed what I saw. Uh, I enjoyed the team, and I, what convinced me was the people. I think I had a perception that people in academia were the brightest and were the better minds, and I was wrong. Uh, I quickly learned that. Through my experience, I met really incredibly talented scientists, and I had a lot of the fancy and best toys at my disposal. Uh, another thing that was very uh, convincing to stay in, in industry was the fact that the speed, um, I'm a very impatient scientist, I like to do things fast, and the speed at which I could do my science in industry, the opportunity that I had was a lot faster than than in academia, rather than writing grants and waiting a long time to get funding to do the work I wanted to do. In industry, as long as I had a rational uh, 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 and a convincing uh, uh, story of why I wanted to do some research that fit, that was valuable to the company, I was given the opportunity, I was given the resources, and I was able to do science in a lot faster way. So um, that's a very short story of why I ended up in academia and what convinced me to stay in academia. I'm, I'm sorry, in industry, I should say, rather than in academia. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll, keep it, I'll keep it to that. I know there are other panelists, but I'll be happy to answer more questions if needed. Oh, excellent. Um, thank you, Carlos. Um, I want to remind people that are on the phone, mute, uh, remember to mute your phones. Um, there's still some background noise. Um, so just a uh, reminder to meet yourself if you're on, even if you're on the phone, you have to do it on the phone because if we do it, um, then you won't be able to unmute yourself. Um, Deborah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so my story is a little bit different. I actually, I went to grad school without knowing what I wanted to do. Um, right before grad school, I did a co-op for one year in the industry, and I did it in a manufacturing facility, and I, I knew I didn't, I wasn't 100% convinced I wanted to the industry, so I said, I want more science, and decided to go to grad school. In grad school, I really liked that I was getting the science part of, of what I was missing. However, I knew that the academia was probably the academic world was not for me because I wanted to be more part of a team, do what I would consider like, like see the finishing things, um, not do so much fundamental research. Um, so right at when I graduated, I, I was 100% sure I wanted to go back to industry, but I did not want to go to the manufacturing operations. I wanted to go to a, to a scientific a, a role in the industry, and that's how I decided. So fortunately, I went back to where I started, back to Amgen, um, but instead of going to the manufacturing facility, I went straight to the, to the process development team, which is what I'm doing right now. It's a very more, it, even though it's an industry, there's a lot of teamwork if you really want to work with big teams and, and do things together. Industry is definitely one of the, the, the best places for, for actually interacting with a lot of different people. And that helps you learn new things. It's very different from academia. I used to think that academia was a little bit lonely uh, environment. Um, so I think that those were probably the things that, that, I, that I wanted to, to pursue. I also, I, I felt that I wanted to do managerial roles, more of leadership roles, and that also put a lot of um, pressure on me on, on deciding that that was the path that I wanted to go. Thank you. Um, Nacho. Uh, in uh, probably 1997 or so, I was practicing my my vet, as a vet here in the island of Puerto Rico, and uh, I always had a tendency towards more industrial sort of a mindset. I guess coming from an entrepreneurial family, uh, it sort of made more sense to me than your regular vet that you know does your you know like a doctor for your pet 
you know, I was more always involved in the more agricultural side of things, uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, population medicine, which it involves a lot of economics and how you produce more, keep the animals healthy with minimal use of medication, et cetera. And when you do that, you get exposed to a lot of biological products, actually, I think. Uh, veterinary medicine probably started using biotech much much earlier than and than uh, human medicine i mean polycera and you know uh, polyclonal antibodies uh, from one animal transferred to another etc has been done for years in veterinary medicine so i i really like that understood that very well uh, got exposed to a lot of a lot of diseases that still I thought could be solved by a biotechnology method and that I was sitting sort of in a crossroad where I was on an island that agriculture was disappearing uh, so but on the other hand a lot of pharmaceutical experience uh, a lot of know-how on how to make and, and, and create uh, drugs at that time, more small molecules than biologics. Biologics were coming along here in the island, and uh, I said, "Well, you know, I think I have all the all the all the pieces here, right here, right in front of me, to switch from being a practitioner to actually developing uh, products." And I think that's what made me make that switch. Uh, life then got me into into thinking more beyond cows and dogs and cats because uh, you know i i was personally hit very close by by you know cancer and these sort of uh, uh diseases that you know we a lot of you guys probably work on or or are in, interested on and i said well you know with the all i've learned about making biologics I mean, still in the middle of a island that at that time the government was calling Bio Island. And I said, well, you know, I think I, I want to do something a little bit more with more reach. I want to try to get into the biomedical side of things, which still didn't mean giving up on all my veterinary knowledge because, as you know, animals are used heavily in our field. So I sort of twisted all that around and, you know, got myself some very cool partners that really knew about biomedical. And we created a team that now it's eight years old and, you know, a small company that's been growing in the island, focused on making great tools to accelerate pro human proteomic research, basically. So... It's been sort of a wild and crazy ride, but it, there's a little method to the madness. <laughs> I love that. Um, so you kind of alluded to this, um, but I think your path is, is particularly interesting because you're not just in, in industry, but you created your, your own company. So my next question for, for the three of you was, is um, what, were there specific steps that you took to to prepare to make that transition um, from, in your case, not sure, from being a vet to to being an, an entrepreneur in industry who's really thinking about um, you know producing biomedical products? You're you're really thinking about how to make biologics, but in general, were there any particular steps that you took to to prepare for for that transition, or was that kind of an iterative process? Well, I think I, I think the, I definitely took some steps, but I didn't I, I didn't feel I was planning them. It just happened. I mean, I just started getting hungry about all this and spent a lot of time, you know, uh, being a vet during the day and a and a student at night, just teaching myself or surrounding myself with good mentors and bugging them till they get, you know completely bored of hearing my questions you know and and i guess 
you got to know and learn very well what you do, either through a, you know, a structured academic program like you guys are doing, in, specifically in the biomedical sciences, or by just yourself, auto teaching yourself, uh, you know, in, on the areas that you think you need uh, strengths. Obviously, first, the science was important to learn, understand it, then the business, right? How to run a business. And, and I think one particular step that I helped me that I did on that front because you know we're not taught either in vet school or in 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 in, in biomedical sciences where you're not taught business so I think a lot of that I learned from mentors you know obviously open up my eyes to that and making sure I started to look at those things we're also participating in in enterprise which is a, a, a you know group of why I can sponsor business plan competition here in the island that it's not just a competition you just show up with your business plan it, 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 it is a you know like a year-long preparation where they teach you to make your business plan but you're really learning business as you do that so I think that was pretty important for me that and surrounding myself with the right mentors and you know Sacrificing some family time, some leisure time, at that just to learn. Yeah. All right, um, Carlos. What about you? Were there any particular steps that you took? Um, you mentioned that you know you thought this was going to be a year thing, and you've stayed at at, at Momenta. Um, but were there any particular steps that you took when you made that? what you thought was going to be a short transition and after you were there, were there specific steps that you talk, uh, you took to, to kind of um, develop yourself in, in the industry? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's, it was a funny transition for me, but more than anything else, I, I think um, there's something I, I still call uh, people in my, in my scientists, my team is actually, I tell them, to be a good scientist, you need to develop what I, call, what I call the eagle eye. You need to really be paying attention to what comes comes to you, and you make the best out of it. So, and I apply that in, in in a lot of situations for me in life. So, I was certainly not preparing for industry. Um, my goal, I was really focusing, what can I do to build myself to be a great researcher uh, in academia. Uh, so I was really looking to learn a lot of the different sciences that I needed. Um, I was uh, I was not focused just on, on basic research. What I wanted to do was more uh, translational research that I could apply and develop companies out of my research labs in, in academia. So I had that entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurship uh, mentality behind the research that I was trying to propose in, in, in my in my academic career. But I think the main thing for me, so I was preparing for that. I started building some competencies that I thought were important uh, to be successful in the field. They became very useful as I moved into industry. And I really encourage people to not underestimate them. So uh, communication. Uh, we as scientists are trained uh, to learn science, but we underestimate the, the power of communication. I had many struggles with my PI when she was forcing me to be a better communicator and now I thank her a lot for them because I realize how important it is. It makes a huge difference and we can talk about that in more detail later. But coming back to your question, so communication, discipline in terms of uh, writing and, and uh, distilling information to simple terms, uh, very critical. So uh, I was preparing without knowing. I was preparing to be a good, uh, a good uh, professor with good entrepreneurship background to launch products from my little lab in academia, which turned out to be very good uh, opportunities and very good competencies that I was building to be successful in the street. And so that's how I prepared, not really planning to be in industry, but just more as a well-rounded sign uh, that then could make a difference and and they have become very useful in industry because um, I have been able to grow very rapidly because I'm somewhat different than most of the scientists that join at the same time with me that can not only talk science but can bring it back to a 
perspective of the business, strategy, et cetera, et cetera. So hope that makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the, of the big goals of, of the Yale Ciencia Academy. We want to make sure that we provide career development tools that, so that our fellows can, can be really well-rounded and learn some of these skills, as you, as you said, communication, um, you know, business, being able to bridge gaps between people that virtually speak two different languages. Um, so we, that's one of the things that is very important for us, helping our fellows develop those skills that are going to make them um, well-rounded scientists. Deborah. Yeah, so I think that the one thing that you have to really put into your mind when doing the transition is that it is industry, it's a business, right? So we have to, we tend to be when we're scientists, it's, it's, it's all about the science we want to do, the, the things that are innovative for us, the, the things that we want to, to learn. But in industry, you're part of a community, right? So you have to make sure that you understand that concept because that's probably one of the, I, I manage a group of scientists and when they come right after their PhDs, that's probably the one thing that takes about a year just to realize, oh my God, I wanted to do this experiment, but I don't have the budget to do it because that's not the direction the company's going. So it's keeping that um, open mind that it's, still a business and that you have to be within what whatever the, the strategy of the company is I, I, to me that would be the number one thing yeah. awesome um, all right well we have you guys the fellow sent a bunch of questions but I want you to give I want to give you the opportunity um, to ask so you can either submit questions um, via the chat and we'll call you out, or you can raise your hand. Don't be shy. Come on, I told everybody that you asked tons of questions, so it made me look bad. And a, a lot of the questions you guys submitted were really great. Marvin, yeah. uh, I think maybe race first. Yeah. Susanna has a question. Uh, Marvin, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Yeah, so I want to ask uh, that my first question is uh, What skills do you learn in graduate school that made you That, that were the, the best skills that you had in the industry when you did the transition? So the, for the panelists, you can, you can go ahead and whoever wants to take that question and, and you know, feel free to feed of each other if you want to comment off of somebody, something somebody said, um, go ahead. So whoever wants to start can go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll provide my two cents. Um, it, it is, uh, there's a lot of things that you learn and, and sometimes I go through different programs. I have the opportunity to still work with some of the universities in the area and and some programs have different requirements, but um, there's a few things that are in common that I think uh, makes a big difference as a running a PhD and writing a thesis. One of it is perseverance. 90% of the time that you're doing your PhD, things are gonna fail. And it is a brutal reality, but it's a very good reality that prepares you for what comes next. You get used to doing things uh, that you know are going to be difficult, but that you find your way and you learn about yourself a lot during those years of things you can accomplish and things that if you establish, which is the second one, if you establish a right process to really overcome some of the challenges, you'll be amazed at what you can do. At least in my personal belief, I think that those are some things that you learn through a PhD training that are kind of intangible because nobody teaches you that and nobody tells you this is what you need to learn. It's just more, I think it's, it's more of a, a personal experience that you go through that you start as one person, you learn what failure is and you learn how to overcome that failure. And at the end of the day, you come out of the, uh, of the other side very successful by being able to have something tangible as an accomplishment and something written that you have been able to do. To do. 
and it gives you a lot of confidence of what comes next and, and it makes it empowers you to do a lot of new things so i think that's the number one thing there's a lot of things that you don't learn through phds that you just learn along the way but i would say that that's probably the the common denominator that i've seen uh in a phd Great, Deborah or Ignacio, does anyone want to add anything to sure. Carlos? Sure, I'll come from a different angle since, like I said, I come from a sort of a different background, but it, 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 it did teach me something that I apply every day in my business or running our company and our research. And it's when you're a vet, you are, you got to be very, bottom line conscious or price or cost because either is it a farmer it's struggling you know to does this make sense do i vaccinate all the cows does it really going to give me benefit or not or what not you got to convince them that way that it's actually beneficial or if it's even a pet you know you got to convince somebody hey you let's see how we can help you with without breaking your piggy bank right like Let's cut some corners here that are going to make a sort of a poetic, are you going to use my poetic license, my gut, and just go to here, bypassing something that may be ideal, like, a, I don't know, a CD scan or something. We don't even have that machine here, so why bother, right? Let's just go straight to what I think it's going to be. That doesn't mean cutting corners. It's using your judgment, but being very cautious of, conscious of cost it's something that in industry is going to pay off because at the end of the day it's a business like we have said and if you are a cost conscious person and it's taking steps watching the bottom line of the company they're going to you know you're going to get rewarded for that for sure <laughs> great deborah do you want i'm oh, sure i just wanted to add that the one thing that also prepares you is uh, the critical thinking skills because even though if you go to industry to do something completely different from the from the research that you were doing in terms of science if, if you if you're hiring someone and you can tell that that person has good critical thinking skills that they can strategize that they can think outside the normal um thinking that is something that's going to be extremely helpful for success I agree. I actually, can I add one more thing? I forgot because I, I completely uh, agree with, with Deborah. Uh, the critical thinking skills are, are really uh, it, something that you learn through a PhD. Um, and, but we also, and we talk about all the different things that you learn that are intangible. But at the end of the day, it's really important for those of you who are doing a PhD, you you can diversify and, and multitask and learn many different things. I would also recommend, uh, to Deborah's point, the, the critical thinking skills, but also learn deeply and be very good at one particular thing. It's important. So learning your science well, it's really important. That's what you're there for. You're getting that training. Because otherwise, you can be a good communicator. You can be all these different things, but you could be a little bit of everything and not be nothing at the same time. So I think for me, it was important that at the end of the day, even if I fail in something else, at least I, I pride myself that I said, at least people believe that I'm a good scientist. Beyond that, I can add other things to my repertoire, but there has to be one thing that you're good at. Otherwise, you can be looked at as someone not like, funny or not, not with good fundamentals. So I, it's important to learn all these things great critical think, thinker, great uh, uh, communicator, all those things. Uh, but you also have to be grounded on at least one thing that you can take pride, pride on in the future because you're going to be relied upon that, at least in your work in the future. Okay, great. So kind of developing a niche uh, uh, trade or expertise. Um, we had uh, Susana raising her hand next. Uh, Susana, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? So I know that this uh, varies between industries and industry, but what is the next new thing or the skill that we need to learn now that can be useful for the 
like for a year or two where we go to the next step in industry? Should we learn how to code? Should we learn, should we take MBA classes? What, what is in the top of the priority list of the things that we should learn? I mean, I want to learn everything, but what is the first thing that I should really do? <laughs> Uh, jump in, anybody. Deora, I think you're muted if you want to talk. No? Carlos? Anyone wants to say that? Otherwise, I'll, I'll yeah. jump in. And my bias, um, so I may be biased, but this is my personal opinion. There's a lot of new uh, techniques and new uh, parts in science that are emerging. Uh, some of them that are more validated than others. And uh, I, in my personal humble opinion, there are many different things that people say, nanotechnology or this. Uh, to me, many of those are not proven and they, I don't see yet a good business connection to them. Uh, I think that, that translational medicine, well, translational medicine is a, is a very broad term that people use many different ways, but... Um, really uh, diag looking at big data, big data and, and, and uh, processing big data, tools that process big data to draw conclusions from patterns in studies, especially as you get closer to clinical studies and patients, big data and being able to process big data, uh, it's opening a new field that it's emerging, it's moving very fast, the reason why I think it's, it's, it's important, I don't think it's mature enough, but why it's important is because it just gets you closer to the reality. Sci scientists for decades, for centuries, we've been mini we're taking the minimalistic approach. You try to bring down everything into something simple to make it uh, manageable. Uh, and it's just because of necessity. The tools are not there to process uh, complex systems. However, the, the history is evolving. Now there are tools to look at more complex systems. And so you're starting to look at humans as a whole rather than a little protein that interacts with one receptor, which in reality in humans doesn't really happen. It interacts with so many different things and, and there's so many parameters that are affected at the same time, but we tend to see them as a vacuum. So if I were to give my two cents and my very humble opinion, but maybe Ignacio and Deborah has a very different uh, opinion, I would say that managing big data uh, to be able to process uh, complex and understand complex systems is really what's changing right now. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Carlos. I think in that respect, getting a strong uh, background or foundation on bioinformatics and being able to talk to your bioinformatician and really understand what the hell he's saying <laughs> is very important because tools are getting very complex and you need to, these are the guys, actually bioinformatics in general, it's a great field, I believe. But if not, you're gonna have to interact with the bioinformatician because of the tools that we are generating, that genomics is generating, all the next gen stuff, it's all about big data and you need to understand what your bioinformatician is doing, how is he crunching that data, how he's reaching the conclusions that end up being your, your results. So I think bioinformatics, it's a, I wish I could take a night class right now uh, and get up to par. I mean, I've been learning it the hard way and if you have it accessible, I would give it a priority because it's gonna give you ahead and being able to handle all that data and being the person that can handle all that data will give you an edge in every team uh, in industry right now. I think you also should um, stay current with what's happening in the comp like in the industry if you're about to graduate or you know like have one or two years left start looking at what are companies doing like if you're a purification scientists look at whether monoclonal antibodies are still current or if people are moving their pipelines to something else because you want to go to an interview and at least let the company know that you know what the what what is coming next and, and if you start teaching yourself about those technologies that are coming out next then you're going to have more chances to have a better conversation in terms of interview 
Wonderful. We have a lot of questions now. They're just pouring in. Um, and I'm going to try to combine a uh, some of them. So Melissa had a question that was, I think, geared to Deborah, but I think every, all the panelists can probably answer. Um, and then I'm going to combine it after Melissa asked the question with a question that came from Wilmarie. So Melissa, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, Melissa, you're, you're muted. <laughs> Let me see if I can unmute you. Go ahead and try. No. Can you hear her? No. Um, all right. Sorry, Melissa. I'm going to ask a question for you. Uh, Melissa asks, what steps did you take to get a managerial role in the company? And how did you prepare for manager a managerial position? And then Wilmari had a broader question that had to do about transferable skills. How do you um, acquire more training in skills that can be transferred to um, the, uh, an industry position? I think for the, right when I joined the company, but the number one thing you have to do is get a mentor, right? Get the right people to, like those people with more experience, learn from them, ask them to help you, you try to help that. At the end of the day, your career is gonna be driven in the direction that you drive it, right? People used to think that your boss, your manager is the one that is gonna make you be successful, but it is yourself. You have to drive your career. You have to look for facilitators for driving that. You have to be very, um, not aggressive, but you have to be very assertive on what you want. You have to communicate what you want and things are gonna come up. I would say that learning from mentors, getting the experience by trying to help people, offering your help so that you can get that training, you're gonna fail at some time. So learn, that every time you fail, instead of taking that as a bad thing for you, look at what you learn from the failure, and that is gonna help you. You're gonna notice that that's gonna help you to, to mature more and to become to, to have more skills that are gonna help you to get into, when you wanna get to a leadership of managerial role. Transferable skills, I would say communication is the number one thing in terms of make sure that you're every day, you're learning how to communicate better. Simple is, is, is good. You don't have to, to, to be too complex, but communicate well, ask people for feedback. Even if you go to a meeting or talk to someone, ask for feedback, what things do you think I should change? And instead of focusing on the, all of the things that you have to change, focus on one or two of them at a time and then move to the next one. And, and, and that way you can make sure that you're going to be successful. Great. Uh, Carlos and uh, Ignacio, you both are also, well, Ignacio, you're the CEO and, and Carlos, you also have a leadership position. What practical advice do you have for graduate students to start developing those leadership skills while they're still in graduate school? Well, I think, uh, let me, Carlos, I'm gonna take a shot at this first. So uh, I think uh, in my, from my perspective, I like the, the team members in, in my group that I see growing as leaders now, as we've been growing, are the people that leave the shyness at the door, you know, and are really gung ho and, you know, see me drinking a cup of coffee and go and sit down next to me and start asking me questions and getting that mentorship, you know, because I like to mentor, but, you know, it's not like I'm constantly reminding myself or have a, a scheduled time for that. You got to take advantage of. The fact that you see your mentor sitting somewhere and go and ask and, you know, get hungry for that and don't be shy because if you just are full of wishing to grow but don't do nothing about it, I mean, it's, it's you're not going not gonna to do it. I see the people that really break that barrier and become and are hungry for the mentorship and look for it are the ones that typically grow quickly. I, I completely agree with, with Ignacio and Deborah. <clears throat> um, you really, you need to take opportunity. This is what I was saying originally, right? The, um, with everything you do, you take opportunities. If it's something that you like, no one is going to come to you and say you want to be a manager 
will give you this opportunity. Very, very uh, uh, unlikely that that will happen. So you need to take the opportunities. And yeah, some some companies will give you courses. They're they're tools to be a better manager, and you can you can find those in the internet. Uh, it's easy to to find them. But I think to Ignacio's point, I think one of the main things that you do is you find people that you think are doing the right thing, that are behaving one way, that are doing things in a way that you would like to imitate. And you try to spend time with those people. You learn a lot. I think probably the best things that I've learned have been because um, I follow, I try to identify someone that does something right. And then I try to imitate what they do because I think I would love for people to do the same thing the way this person does it. So I'll just try to imitate. And from there, I think most of my managerial experience have really come from that. I think uh, a lot of the managerial experience is really common sense. Uh, a lot of it is common sense in human nature and how you interact with people, how you treat people in a way that you would like to be treated, how you uh, do things for people so that uh, they can actually grow and build things around you so that you're not the only one doing them because otherwise you're going to burn out. So you need to work as a team. But the most important thing is really trying to identify people that, <clears throat> that worked in a certain way and that then you can learn from them. Just by, by being with them in the same room, by learning to communicate like they do. Uh, so it's simple. Just keep your eyes open and try to learn from, from people around you as much as you can. Awesome. So I'm hearing a couple of things. I've heard communication mentioned a whole lot, which makes me incredibly happy because um, I just love communication. Um, so learn to be an effective and good communicator, um, work on your interpersonal skills. Um, I think something that all of you mentioned is to be proactive. You have to, you know, if you want something, you have to go and look for it, either get the training or learn it, find mentors that can help you find workshops, workshops or courses, um, that you can learn. That's Another reason why having a, a career plan, so an individual development plan, which is something that we've been working on, is really important because you can identify what are those skills that you need to develop um, and finding the opportunities to, to do that while you're still training. Um, and so there's been a few questions about postdocs and fellowships. So several people have been asking about whether or not they should do consider doing a postdoc is doing a postdoc does it make you more competitive um, before going or applying for an industry job is that the way to go do you want to do an academic postdoc or do you do an industry postdoc so what are your thoughts on doing a postdoc either in academia or industry before applying for an industry job I'm going to take a shot at that because I've hired a few postdocs and uh, you know, there's some areas that require that you have a postdoc. I mean, it's just, they're that demanding, you know, in terms of uh, the knowledge that require that before you get out and feel that you're an expert, which is really what the industry person's looking to hire. I mean, it's just no other way. So it, it, it's going to depend a lot on what, what are you, what what what's the that 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 niche that you found yourself that you're you're developing yourself that Carlos was talking about? There's some that don't require to go that far, and that are more dependent on how good you are as a team leader or a person, and you know you know enough of the of the team to move into an industry. But if you're going to be the technical person running a you know a very complex the systems biology, the, you know, set up for a company, then you probably need a postdoc. So it, it, it depends on what, what's your goal, what's that career plan that you have, and, uh, and are you the technical guy or, or girl, or, or, or are you more interested in, in having more of a global view of science so that you can then expand into that business with, with enough knowledge that you can – talk to people from the technical side and the business side and know what they're talking about. So it depends. But if you are really in there for the science and being 
part of a science team. I think you, especially in these areas that we've been talking about, about big data, bioinformatics, and things like that, I think some sort of postdoctoral training is, is, is useful. I just want to add that it, it also is going to depend on what you want to do next, right? Because, for example, I work at a commercial facility and probably we, we, don't, we, we don't ask people to have postdocs. So if you know that you're going to be working at a science but more of a supporting group for, for operations, then I don't think you might need it. However, if you want to be in a very R&D early development group, postdocs are definitely uh, recommended, either in industry or academia. But it, it depends on in, with what part of the science world you want to be in the early, early development research or more of the product development part that would make a, a, a big difference. Okay, um, following up on the industry postdoc question. I, you, oh. I completely with, with that. I, kind of, I have, I think, a challenge with my network here, but can, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so I, I completely agree with Deborah. It depends what you're looking for. If, uh, if you're more into uh, development, uh, it, it is less required to have a postdoc, and it, it, it's still helpful, uh, but it's not as required. If you're in research, uh, discovery, research, to the transition of development, it is helpful to have a, a postdoc. Um, it typically, I, I tend to hire more people with postdocs because uh, I see the PhD as a, as a time to learn the science, and then the postdoc it's really more about learning about yourself and how to handle science and how you develop your tools and your strategic thinking that you can use in the future. So Pozog is it's very useful in that sense. Okay, um, so uh, Ivelisse, I think I also had a question about, um, in addition to maybe considering an industry postdoc, maybe starting a little bit earlier and considering doing an internship. Ivelisse, do you want to expand a little bit more about that? Hi. Um, do you see me? I'm not sure. No, we don't see your video, but we hear you. Okay. Now we see you. There you are. Okay. My question is regarding um, internships, because especially in Colorado, there have been an increase in biotech companies and, and entrepreneur small companies. And I have uh, one of the recent PhD students that graduated last year join um, a new small company. And I was wondering, he, he did uh, an internship um, a few months before graduating. So I was wondering if an internship will be helpful not only to help you determine whether you like industry, but also if that's going to open. Uh, your opportunity to, let's say, not having a postdoc, but using that as an experience in industry. And, and also, uh, a side question will be, and, and with this I'll wrap up, um, is what was the uh, most challenging thing that you encountered when you started industry and your PhD didn't prepare you for that? So, uh, should I, should I, Take, take a first swing at this. So this is Ignacio. Uh, in terms of internships, we love interns in small biotech world because you know we can advance uh, our programs while also it's like an extended interview, you know, for a potential new hire. So I mean, I believe like ninety percent of the people that work for us in their research and development side of the company have come through as an intern from the industrial biotech department of UPR, you know, and then we hired them afterwards because they did a great job and now they're ready, already trained and, you know, they, for them, they already accustomed themselves to the culture, to the an industry, you know, team working atmosphere that we were talking about earlier. So I think, 
I, I, I'm a fan of interns. Uh, in terms of the second question, uh, I think uh, something that not at least my career didn't prepare me for and yours probably hasn't, especially where you're going to work on a small company where everybody at some point needs to interact with customers, is customer service and, you know, dealing with, you know, trying to please your customer all the time, make sure that customers always right type of mentality. I mean, that's something that you got to turn the hard way and bite your tongue sometimes. You know, they did the wrong experiment or they did it wrong, but you got to figure out how to please them and retain them as customers. I mean, that from our perspective, that's been challenging for me, but I'm getting better at it. So I will add to, to what Ignacio said. Um, I think the one of the the, the, main, the most challenging things that you find when you join the, the company coming from academia is there are two things. One is working in teams. How do you work in teams? Typically in academia, you're working on your project alone. And so you lose perspective on that you can do the work in a most in a much more effective manner if you actually work in teams and you're able to manage how to work in teams. Uh, the second thing is what I call working backwards. Uh, in science, typically in your training, your PhD, you're always working forward. You have a technique, you apply it, and then hopefully you'll get somewhere uh, in industry and actually in any what in whatever you do, even in academia. One of the best things you can do is how to work backwards. So identify the problem. You really know exactly what is your end goal. And then you work backwards, independently of what you've been trained of, trying to find what are the best tools to get you to the answer. So those are probably two different things that you don't get trained for very well, but that are very useful in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in switching to industry. In terms of the internship, very, very valuable to do an internship if you can. Uh, it, it's like like Ignacio was saying, so it could be a long interview. And typically, if you do a great job, if you take advantage of the opportunity, you can get a job at the end of it. Uh, so uh, hopefully that will answer your question. I was, I briefly wanted to add, um, and I, I was looking at the chat, that's why I, I, I thought about that as well. Um, if you can do an internship, don't panic. Um, try to do as much network as you can because the internship is definitely going to help you. It's like a long-term uh, interview, but if not, get a network of people that you can talk to from the different industries, and that's definitely going to it's going to give you a lot of uh, advantages. I see that someone posted um, about the, the SMDP biotech program. I actually know that program very well because I was a mentor in that program for a while. So look at programs like that one that are going to connect you with people in industry because even if you don't get the full internship experience from a scientific perspective, you're going to get the mentorship experience that you need and that's going to be helpful at the end. Great. Um, really quickly, Deborah, maybe since you've had experience with um, that type of program, when is it the best time to do an internship? At what point during your graduate training? It, early on, a little bit later, um, third year, fourth year? Uh, it, it depends on, on what, it, especially for that kind of program and internship, it depends on what you want to get out of it. I've, I've had mentees that are just in their first year and we keep that mentorship relationship like like for example the one that I had that started first year she's actually now being a being interviewed by Amgen and other companies and and we created that uh, that relationship I would say that at least if in my my personal opinion give yourself at least two years of grad school so that you know how that's going and you know uh, you, you get a little bit more a uh, uh, skills learn more skills so that when you get to the internship you can do uh, you can be better positioned when competing with other people um, so my recommendation would be after your second year but if you if you happen to get the opportunity early don't just do it as well I, I mean don't 
we tend to rush a little bit to graduate and things like that, but give yourself time enough to learn what's happening out there and to also get opportunities outside your, your comfort zone. And this is, internships are gonna help you so much that you're, you're gonna see the benefit at the end. Great, thank you. Um, Anna had a question that a lot of people uh, really resonated with and, and responded to. So Anna, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Um, can you hear me? Yeah? Please? Yes. Okay. Um, so I've met a lot of people that have PhDs and work in the industry for many years, and they've told me that there are way more positions open and for growth opportunities for engineers rather than for PhDs in basic sciences. So in your experience, is this real? Is it something that you've encountered? And if so, is there something that uh, people like us with basic science background has to do to actually stand out over everyone else? <laughs> Well, I can tell you that from um, this is a, a large company. From my experience here, you it depends where you want to go. Again, if you want to go closer to the manufacturing and operation side of the business, you're gonna find a lot of engineers. If you want to go to the early development and the, the the research and developing products and pipeline, you're gonna get more science. Um, more science. Definitely, Puerto Rico is the hub for manufacturing. Um, so that's something that uh, we compete a lot. I have a scientific background and we have about half scientists and engineers. One can do the work of the other, right? Um, but if you wanna do very early stages uh, sciences, it's probably more, um, more relevant than engineer. I don't know if Carlos or Nisha wanna have. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It depends, it depends what area of the industry you go into. Uh, I think manufacturing, you, you get a bit more of a mix of both engineers and scientists. Uh, as you get er to earlier development, discovery, in, in my team, most of them are scientists uh, because, uh, and, and depending on the technology also you're working with, if it's really into development, development of, man of uh, therapeutics, uh, it's more scientists in the early, part of the discovery to the transition into development. But as you're more into manufacturing, there may be a bit more mix uh, of engineers and, and scientists. We, we are, in, in our case, uh, we're mostly, a, you know, a small R, large D company with little manufacturing so we we're more into the scientists so i mean i think i think there's there's room for everybody i mean it, it it's it depends on the on this like deborah was saying on on which section of the of the of the development and eventual production chain you you want to go into and if you're a scientist obviously then you you should be looking at the early r d uh, and 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 the development process development areas of, 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 of you know in, in biotech rather than the manufacturing side because that's where the engineers are <laughs> um had a question jo, can she Jomari, can you um, turn on your microphone do you want to make it yourself i think it goes well with the question that we were just talking about if not, I can make it for you. Um, going once. Okay, um, Jomari's question was um, a little bit related. She says that there's uh, something called the STEM paradox that while employers have a high need for STEM professionals, it does seem that uh, just in some instances, PhD graduates have a hard time finding jobs in industry is that something that you think is uh that you've seen is it is it a reality or maybe it's a misconception or are you recruiting more from um postdocs or um from earlier stages so um i will take that uh to start um the reality really depends again if uh if uh, if I'm actually in my job in early discovery to to early development, uh, 
it, actually PhDs are really important. So unless you go, typically if you have a PhD, you come in as a scientist uh, level. So you may have, the, it depends on really what you're looking for, but typically a PhD is extremely valuable uh, and it allows you to advance your career faster. That, that's more in, in, in my world, but I don't know, Deborah and, and Ignacio may have a, a different opinion. I don't know if it is our location or, or I, I, I still haven't figured out, but it's actually really difficult for us to be able to hire PhDs. Um, we, we, we open positions for PhDs that take a long time to be filled because we don't get as many applications as we uh, typically um, would, would think for like bachelors. In terms of bachelor's degree or master's, it depends on what you need, if you need someone with more experience or not. But I, I found ourselves here in, in, in our group sometimes struggling to get PhD students the experiences, or not the experiences, but at least the skills that we want, which is surprising, right? Um, Ignacia, what about you? I know you've hired um, Puerto Rican PhDs. Um, is this something that you definitely look for for your company? I mean, yeah. I mean, I think I think there's room for everything. I mean, uh, in a company, you need all levels, right? So there's definitely room for PhDs. Uh, there's depending on what sort of a company you are uh, and what sub area of biotech you're you you you're is your space you you would need more more or less of that higher level uh, trained uh, uh, staff than you know like intermediate trained more technical staff and so forth so it, it just depends but i think there's i mean i see i see the the, the sector growing i mean not it, I'm, and i'm thinking globally now not 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 in puerto rico but in general growing and it's a very healthy uh, sector of the global economy. I mean, one that's been actually keeping the economy afloat. I, and, and in that perspective, I think there's opportunities. You gotta be good. You gotta strive to be the best and develop all these skills to get the job because nonetheless, there's competition for them, but there's jobs out there for PhDs. There's jobs out there for the you know, intermediate masters. There's jobs for the more technical, industrialized uh, you know hands-on scientists that's going to do the the heavy lifting of the processes and i just think you gotta go for what you feel fulfills you and then strive for the best and go get it wonderful that's, those are great inspirational words um marvin has had his hand raised again for a while so marvin why don't you go ahead and ask your question yeah, I want to ask a question to uh, Deborah. Uh, I know you mentioned at the beginning that sometimes you may have an idea for an experiment, but then you have to remember that you, I don't know if this is the correct way to say it, but you have to work for the company. You know, the, the, there is the company company's interest. And then, so I wanted to know how flexible you are in the industry to do the experiments that you would like to do like I know sometimes uh, you may find a way okay uh, if I try this maybe it's a more efficient way but then it is not the best way for the company so how flexible is the company for you to do the experiments yeah it, so it's going to depend on what stage of the of the of the of the development you are if you're in early development you're going to have a lot more flexibility because it's not a product that is already in the market so as long as the product works and the quality of the product it's good yeah, or you think that it's going to be good they're going to allow you to do what the research that you want to get to that to that stage um from a commercial perspective it's a little bit different because if for example, I work in a team that supports products that are already available in the market. So I have room and flexibility as long as I don't change the end product. I can do the, the process more efficient, I can do it better, but I have to confirm that my product is not gonna change. And that's when you get a little bit of a, of struggles um, because sometimes you just want to see something to see what's going to happen next but if you already know that there's a chance that your product is going to change then the company is not going to want to do that plus 
you can design a new process to get to the same product, but if it's not costly efficient, then the company also has a, a their interest, right of, of of revenue, and that probably is not going to slide from a from a keeping doing experiments perspective. Okay, great. Um, Carlos. Yeah, I'll just add to what Deborah said. I, um, as you get into later phases of development, the less likely that you're going to have flexibility to, to really to modify things. Remember that you are really pushing for a product that is going to end up in humans, and there's a lot of systems and regulations that have been put in place to make sure that the that the product is safe. So if you start modifying things, it may jeopardize the the uh, safety of the product or, or other things. So the, so the, that's more in later parts of the development. In earlier parts of the development, I think there's more flexibility. However, at the same time, uh, the flexibility comes as long as you understand what is the end goal. So if your end goal, at least if you're modifying things or you're doing research, that it's going to add a value to the end goal, great. If you're doing research that is just going to eat resources and not going to yield something that it's going to be useful for the company, it, it's challenging to have that flexibility. You can see that as a negative or you can see it as a positive. I see it as a positive. I even saw it as a positive as I was making the transition to industry because <clears throat> something that I realized was that uh, the worst, actually, one of the major dangers that I have was myself. I could have a lot of ideas and try to do so many things that at the end of the day, if I had no boundaries, I could end up in a place that was not really useful at the end. So you could do a lot of research that at the end of the day may be, may be meaningless or may lead you to something that it's not really valuable at the end. So the company, at least even in early research, you have flexibility, but as long as it actually it's productive towards the goal that the company has. So that may there may be some boundaries. There's some flexibility more at the earlier stage than at the later stages of development. Great. And I would like to say I was at a conference earlier this week, and there was a, somebody from Procter & Gamble, and they also talked about that the fact that they really look towards their PhD hires to be bring their creativity, which is something that obviously um, you are training for, um, to bring that creativity to the positions. That's really why they're hiring PhDs is to help those companies innovate, be it in a process or in a market or in an area. Um, so they're definitely that um, that's a myth. The the fact that um, there, there's no creativity in, in industry. Um, so I wanna, um, I wanna switch gears a little bit. I know we have a, a, a couple of other questions that are more geared towards um, biomedical um, areas, but we do have a number of um, fellows here that come from other um, backgrounds um, in psychology, behavioral sciences. So I wanted to ask the, the panel as a whole if, if you know, if there are opportunities for other type of um, uh, dis scientific disciplines uh, in industry, be it for psychologists, um, or in general, um, maybe after you answer that question, what are the options for industry to collaborate with people in academia? So for, for some of our fellows that are going to be, you know, are really de decided to go into academia, um, are there opportunities still for them to collaborate um, with industry. So psychologists, pharmacologists, other disciplines, what type of roles are there in industry? And are there opportunities for collaborations with academia? I'll take that. Actually, I think psychologists could, yeah, I think, I think the more, um, I mean, we are in a very competitive environment. Right. I mean, this is once you get into industry, you got to pedal to the metal and, you know, creativity of your creative team has to be to the highest. And the teams that are supposed to be delivering goods or experiments need to be, you know, to the highest. So stress could be a big issue in a company 
uh, even though you may be happy, you may be happy with your pay, you may be happy with what you're doing, the goals of the company, the mission, the vision, et cetera, still it's a high stress environment. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in psychology and in industrial psychology, I think. And uh, I, I would love to have a psychologist <laughs> as part of my, an intern psychologist figure this out, how to, how to make uh, the environment less stressful sometimes just because of the high competitiveness of the work that we do. So I think there's definite room for that, either as a collaboration or even I envision, and I'm sure bigger companies do have their own psychologies in-house, but I think it's a big, big important thing to have. Psychology intertwined with your, with your company. Yes, totally. And it's, it's, it's interesting because sometimes it's not even for stress-related things or sometimes even if you want to restructure your organization, psychologists are there helping you um, do the, the best uh, kind of strategy and, and all of that, which is it's surprising, but they do play a big role in, in how the business can be run as well. Great. And, and what about... Yeah, uh -huh. Go ahead, Carlos. No, I will add that, that although typically it's not a it's not a standard position in most companies having a psychologist. You see an evolution in, in our company. We see when we're doing team building uh, or any type of, of dynamics to improve the the processes in the company. Uh, we actually bring in psychologists to help us mediate those processes. So. So there may be a niche there that some of you that are pursuing psychology degrees, you can actually tap into. It may not be something well established, but you may want to stay uh, at the top of it and try to look at opportunities there because it seems to be emerging now. Great. And what about for those of, of the fellows that are looking to go into academia? Are there still opportunities for them to get involved with industry projects? Um, what, what are the, you know, how, how do you get into a collaboration with industry? if you're in academia. So I, I do a lot of collaborations with academia. Uh, uh, all the time I have different collaborators with academia. Uh, and pretty much we fund the research uh, and we do a, a specific project together for a certain period of time. I think one of the ways is if you're reading in, in, this, in academia and want to do some collaborations with industry it's really you need to stay on top of what's happening in industry i think like deborah was saying uh, a few minutes ago uh one of the important things to do is to try to uh, try to stay on top of what is wh how things are evolving in, in industry what are the companies the new companies the emerging small biotechs are looking into what are the new signs that they're doing because academia by necessity most of it really merges and, 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 and modifies itself in historically to feed the purpose of industry because at the end of the day, the science that you're doing gets applied to something and to products. So you just need to be aware of what's happening in industry and try to do research that it's uh, apply research. Um, Ignacio, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I wondered if, if the question was uh, broad like that or related to the same psychology uh, topic. No, no, it's it's broad. In I, the I, broad term? Yeah, how, yeah, what's I the guess. practical path of uh, collaboration? If, if you're, I mean, I think we, we do have the various collaborations, ones that have helped us grow. So the collaborator, the institution is bigger than us and it's actually... Uh, we're leveraging on that for our growth and we have smaller collaborations in which now we are you know accelerating people through getting them access to our technologies to uh, we, we, we don't have enough money to actually fund but we can actually you know provide uh, the tools and, and and the resources so that's the way we collaborate and I think it's again it goes to the same path if you want to grow inside the company you you, you leave your shyness out the door. You think you have a good idea. You got to believe in yourself. Go knock on that company's door and say, hey, I want to collaborate. I, want, I have this idea. What do you think? Worst case, you're going to say no. I mean, 
uh, you're not going to lose anything. But in most instances, you're going to find that if it's a good idea that goes is aligned with the missions or, or, or strategic vision of the company, you're going to have uh, traction and you're going to be helped and you're going to be, you know, supported. Okay, wonderful. Um, so Carlos uh, had a question a little bit ago that I wanted to give him the opportunity to ask. It's a very practical question. Carlos, do you want to go ahead? Uh, you hear me? Yes. Okay, the question is like whether, what will be the name of the position that we will be looking for for people that have a PhD in biomedical science? Like what? kind of title we will be looking into the job offer? Uh, it depends on the company, but it can be something as simple as scientists. Like some, some companies do scientists one, two, three, and, and you're gonna see in the job description. It's sometimes that has to do with the many years of experience they're asking, but typically you're gonna see scientists, um, or you can get names like process development scientists or attribute science sci scientists. But the term is going to be there. For engineering, you're going to see just a, an engineer, engineer one, two, three, senior engineer role. Yeah. I think it's very, should be very straightforward. Yeah, typically job descriptions, I mean, just if you see a keyword that interests you, just dig in and look at the job description and you will find the answer right there. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Scientists is typically what, what you get when you're PhD if you're going into biomedical science. Okay. Um, Marvin also asks about um, whether lean uh, process certifications or seen Six Sigma certifications are recommended or something you recommend and when Mari previously had asked about um, you know how engineers it seems like sometimes they have a leg up on in industry positions so do you recommend that type of more project management Six Sigma type of training as a way to kind of get an additional um, you know look at your CV or a foot in the door I think project management skills are always going to be very helpful. Um, that's that's going to be um, aligned with what you show from your self in terms of leadership skills as well. And at least big companies, if you can talk the Lean Six Sigma language, that's definitely going to be a plus um, for for getting hired. Maybe it's not that you're going to need it, but if you have it, it's definitely a plus. Okay, um, so Sulmari, I think you have a pretty good question. Um, do you want to go ahead and answer and ask it? You hear me? Yes. Um, so I was wondering, I know that you guys answered um, with the title question to look for scientist positions, but are there other opportunities for PhDs in industry um, in other positions such as um, product management, sales, marketing, or other type of positions that are not based on wet lab skills? Sure. Even in the, we, you can have PhDs working in the quality organization or complaints organization. These are the ones that actually get the complaints from patients and all of that. Sometimes they require people with technical knowledge, but it's not lab work, but you need the technical skills so that you can uh, execute your job. Um, statisticians, um, we, do, we do have groups of specifically for statisticians and people with PhDs in math, in math or, or other disciplines like that. So it's not necessarily going to be laboratory work. You can have PhDs as well in operations, just manufacturing day-to-day -day operations as well. And for those titles, you're probably going to see director or senior manager. Sometimes senior manager can be a tricky word. You're going to see that in a lot of job postings. So like Carlos mentioned, look at the job description and if you feel the requirements, 
then go for it. Um, because sometimes it could be misleading the way they, it's a very general title that they give, um, but the job description is gonna guide you to, to exactly what, what you're looking for. Okay, uh, Ignacio, do you want have anything to add? No, oh, I agree. I, I I agree with that. So I think that's pretty much uh, standard. Yeah. Yeah, I have uh, friends that have PhDs and have gone into technical uh, writers for companies. They've gone into sales and marketing. They've gone into uh, regulatory science uh, within companies, which is something Gabriel mentioned. And and uh, just to add, I mean, I am not in the, we're not in the drug business. We're more in the research product business. So, so in this particular field, you know, your your client is a scientist, and typically your sales force is also scientific. So because they have to communicate and be able to explain experiments that you can potentially do. So. So there's a lot of room for in sales and, and in customer service for scientists that, you know, don't want to go back to the bench or, or but still want to use their scientific knowledge. Okay. Um, and then really quickly, Daisha, um, do you want to ask a question? I, I think it goes well with this uh, question about more specifics, uh, job searching. Uh, we you can you can ask her. I have a lot of noise here. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll ask it for you. Um, do you guys recommend that? You know, how many of the requirements that are in a job description do, should you really have before applying? I mean, if you have seven out of ten or six out of ten, do you recommend that they apply, or do you have to have the ten out of ten requirements that are in the JD? Yeah, I would I would say absolutely you do not need to have the 10 out of 10 um, you even if it's peripherally uh, uh, associated you need to try yeah, if you see a job uh, description uh, you need to try to to get in um, one important thing the mistake that, that typically a lot of people do is they don't read the description they don't learn much about the company before preparing their resume so you always want to tailor your resume as much as you can to a specific company that you're sending to. So, uh, and you may, it may look very different from one company to the other, but but you want to try to tailor your resume towards that company. As people can start reading the resume, they may see something that may be that they may not have put in the in the, the job description, but that they think would be uh, would be beneficial to have. So I wouldn't be too concerned if you're not matching completely what they have in the description. Uh, just trying to 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 tailor as much as you can to what what they do in the company. Yeah, I agree with Carlos on that one. Yeah, and and I think it's very unlikely you're gonna find someone with all the requirements. It's almost impossible, and you never know. Like if you have, I don't know, if you have six out of ten, go for it and show what other things you have that are not written there. Because it might be that at the moment of the interview or during the hiring process, those things um, become even stronger for in terms of what the the hiring manager is looking for, and that might be helpful for you. Yeah, and I should say, uh, you know, women traditionally, um, studies have found, tend to limit themselves in applying for positions um, if they're not exactly what you think your, your qualities are. And that's something I think we need to kind of work ourselves uh, up to, um, you know, to not, not doing, to just going for opportunities. But like Carlos said, read the descriptions very carefully, look for the keywords and make sure that in your cover letter and your resume, you highlight those keywords. Um, all right, so the time flew by, it's already 8.30. Um, I think we had a great session. Um, if I would invite our panelists, if you have some brief words of, that you wanna leave the, the students with, please, please go ahead before we, we close. But thank you so much, all three of you. So Ignacio will start, and I, all I want to say is, uh, you know, we, we focused a lot on how to get a job, but 
one way of getting a job is creating your own and uh, that's the you know you're 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 leaving your shyness at the door and looking around and opening your eyes could start right now at your own university for you know there may be startups nucleating around you you know with projects that may be the next amgen and the next who knows what so open your ears and eyes and always be open to be in a startup especially early you don't have a lot to lose you may start a uh, worst case you know if it's not successful you're going to have a good story to add to your resume and it's definitely going to help you in your next try if you want to go find a job and uh it now is the chance you you're young you you can do it you can just you know find the right project don't go through it you know not so great project but if you find something that it inspires you do it i think one thing that you could tell that we never mentioned money here in terms of what's driving us i don't think that's not the driver here uh, it's 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 intellectual money it's being creative uh, being entertained we like uh, growing our, our our neurons all the time so you know find something that really pulls you in and inspires you and maybe that's as early as a startup coming right out of your project your program so always have that in the back of your mind just in case i would <clears throat> i would agree with ignacio I'll, i'll just add a few minor things i would just say that as you go into this transition of finding jobs or creating your job uh, we we're sometimes too careful of not being cocky and it's important not to be cocky but it's really important to be confident so If you're not confident, fake it. You got to build on that. Uh, but confidence is going to be really a key as you get into this job, either job position or to create your own business. You have to be confident. You have to believe in yourself because you'll project that to everyone around you. And if you are not confident, you'll project that. I think one of the best quotes that I heard uh, from Abraham Lincoln is, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And so you're at that position right now. So I would really encourage you guys to think about that really carefully because that's that's the best thing. You know, you cannot predict what others are going to give you or they're going to react. What you can predict is what you can create. So best of luck to everyone. Well, and I just want to say, just look for your what is your passion and, and, and look at, like, I agree with Ignacio, like, we're so focused on big companies, that's what we read in the news every day, all that, but look at what really is your passion. If you want to innovate, be different. If you want to, to, to work with a bigger team, look at what you really want. And the best way, I think today we have the tools, the best way is through networking, go to LinkedIn, meet people, do what you're doing here, ask people, what are you doing? Talk to the academia guy, to the small company guy, the big company guy, and then you're going to be able to identify what's your passion and go in that direction. So thanks everyone and good luck. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much on behalf of the Yale Science Academy program. Um, we really appreciated you taking your time. Um, so everybody, we're going to stop the recording now. And um, if you want to hang out, we'll be around for a couple of more minutes. And our panelists, if you have something somewhere to, you need to get uh, get to uh, thank you again so much. We really appreciated this. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.